Good evening, everybody. My name is Michael Miebach. I'm a member of the board of Das Progressive Zentrum and one of the founders. And uh, half an hour ago, somebody said, this is like the family coming back together again. And it feels like that for me too. So very nice that all of you made it and stayed till tonight. This is gonna be the leaders panel. One of the highlights of uh, today's conference. And the leaders panel is supposed to answer the question for progressive policy making at the moment. This question is, how do you deliver social justice and climate policy at the same time in those hard days that, are, that we are in, that these hard times that we live in? And let's be honest, the obstacles for this task are very high. Being a progressive these days sometimes feels like your task is that you have to square the circles. Progressive governance, the topic of this uh, conference, sometimes forgotten, it's about progressive governance, was never harder than today. We need to do four th things at the same time. The First and foremost, sometimes, and I think I need to say that, even some of you th m might say, well, that's, uh, for me, it's not new, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's for sure. I think we have to say that the main task at the moment is to secure continuing public support for helping the Ukraine in the war, especially in Germany, that is a task. And we need to <laughs> try to do that. It will not be easy because the winter is coming and the flats are going to be cold, maybe. Not only in the Ukraine. Um, secondly, progressives need to reassess their positions and goals in a rapidly changing environment. Uh, in each country, that's different. In Germany, for example, we now have a debate about the longer use of nuclear plants, which some of the governing uh, coalition parties gets into deep trouble. So we have to reassess positions and goals very, very hard. At the same time, we need to regard the crisis as a progressive opportunity for more social justice, for a better climate policy, and for more European integration. I think the EU will play a key role here the EU, which has a long tradition of turning crises into progress, if you want, just think about the positive developments after the Euro crisis, that uh, the institutional change that occurred, banking union, ESM, and so on. I think that is something that we can learn from and build upon. Fourthly, we need to radiate hope, but without sounding overly optimistic. I would say, without sounding out of touch with reality. I also I, I already brought up those numbers last night. Um, there's a recent uh, poll by Allensbach Institute about uh, the German political mood at the moment, and only 30% of Germans, when asked about the next 10 years, say that they are optimistic. 30% only. And among those who have a lower socioeconomic status, it's only 14% of the people that say they are op optimistic about the future. So not a good environment for progressives, but we have to deal with it. And this squaring the circle tonight is gonna happen with outstanding people that we invited. And we are very proud and, and happy that they came we have two political heavyweights with us tonight. One of them, Franz Timmermans, is on his way from the airport to the venue, and he's going to be here uh, in a couple of minutes, hopefully. Um, the other one will be introduced uh, in a minute. That's Hubert Seil. Um, at least all Germans definitely know him. He's been uh, in German politics for qu quite a while, and Anna Meyer uh, we'll we'll uh, introduce him more closely in a minute. Um, he's our labor minister since five years now, I think. He was the general secretary of the, of the SPD and had all kinds of positions. He's, uh, 
We are very glad to have you. He's a friend of our organization. He's been supporting us from the beginning, and uh, it's really good to have him. Unfortunately, Hubertus uh, has to leave here at 8, so this is not going to be rude, but it's troubling times in German politics. There are uh, other things that he has to deal with, so at 8 he has to leave the panel. Um, uh, but that's okay. We are very glad that you came anyway. Um, yeah, now I'm already introducing people. It's uh, <laughs> somehow happened. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll hand over to Anna now. Anna is a friend of Das Progressive Zentrum as well, and I want to, to really introduce her because she's just not just the host, but she's an interesting figure in herself. She is an editor for the German weekly Die Zeit. She has uh, written a very good best-selling book about poverty in Germany, and um, she's a really interesting person. I'm glad that you are hosting this tonight. Welcome to you, Anna, and I hand over. Is this on automatically? Yes, great. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your warm welcome. Um, I'm very happy to be hosting this tonight. Um, the title of our session is Delivering on Justice and Climate Progressive Leadership in Hard Times. And um, translated into my own words, I'd say it's about uh, creating a society that is climate neutral. And at the same time, people have enough money to and enough money and enough resources to endure this transformation into climate neutrality. And we are going to be discussing this um, with th uh, three panelists, of which one is not here yet, and he will sneak in at a later time. Uh, Franz Timmermans um, will be sitting to my left. He is the executive <laughs> vice president of the European Commission. And uh, basically, any climate laws you've heard of in the EU in the last years. He's, he's been there, he's done that. Um, <laughs> but uh, first, um, I would like to introduce uh, Anke Hasse. Uh, she is a professor of public policy at the Haiti School. And uh, interestingly, she published a book in 2021 that centers around the question of capitalist growth and social welfare. Um, and she was uh, in the Ministry of Labor and Economics when it was still a Ministry of Labor and Economics, I read, uh, between, yes, a long time ago, <laughs> between 2003 and 2004. Um, you want to come to the stage already? Anka Hasse, everyone. And already introduced, thank you so much, we have Hubertus Heil, who has been serving as the Federal Minister of Labor and Social Affairs since 2018. He has ve held various offices in the uh, Social Democratic Party. He grew up in a small town called Peine, which is very important. And he is also the funniest of all federal ministers. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Hubertus Heil is going to, uh, to introduce the session with a small keynote. Well, thank you very much. This was an inside joke between Anna and me, because she wrote a poetry about me, and he's, the first sentence was, he is not funny. <laughs> Dear friends, it's, it's good to see, to see some of you and to be back in the family. I think it's, it's a joke of the history that when I was a young politician, really 20 years ago, I'm a member of parliament since 1989, 1998, um, I took part in the first, no, not, not since the Second World War, no. <laughs> um, the first progressive governance party I took in was in Budapest, in times where Viktor Orban was not prime minister. And now this house here in Berlin is called the Hungary House. Hungary is a nice country. And it's a nice, nice people there. But as progressive, I want to go once upon a time back to Budapest with the progressive governance. That's, that's my <laughs> wish. <laughs> so 
So, as we already heard, tough times for progressives. And let me start with something very basic. I strongly believe that we do not have to choose between crisis management or progressives in these times. It's very important because crisis management is very heavy in our governments. And on the other hand, the question is, do we have enough resources to do both progressive things and crisis management? This is a very fundamental question, but we must not place these two off against each other, quite the opposite. Progress is, progress is not something that is nice to have in uneventful times. Progress is the essence of a free and social democracy. This makes progress a central element in the confrontation with the Putin system. Putin is a dangerous historic ghost driver. He wants to go back to the past. He frankly stands for regress and for revenge. That is true on the international stage and for societies at large. He has often said that he is an enemy of our values and of our free and democratic societies. It is not only logical that Putin is the poster boy of nationalists and right-wing extremists all over Europe. Therefore, it's more true than ever before. Progress in Europe must not become the victim of Putin's aggression, neither of military nor of economic aggression. We will not turn our backs on the goal of a better society. Quite the opposite. We must dare more progress now. I'm deeply convinced. Let me say it in the other word. Putin said in his speeches in St. Petersburg, Petersburg and in Vladivostok, that his aim is to use energy as a weapon to destabilize our societies, to destroy our economy. And I think the progressive message must be clear. He will not win. Not in the Ukraine, not in this way, because he wants to destroy our so solidarity towards Ukraine to use energy as a weapon. And we have to keep our society together. We have to secure our energy and we have to keep our societies in the European Union together. <laughs> He's driving up prices to generate fears, but Putin is underestimating solidarity within the European societies and he's also underestimating the resilience and the strengths of European welfare states. Germany has clear priorities for this crisis management. We are focusing on three challenges. First, the supply of energy. Secondly, inflation. And not last but not least, the assistance for war refugees in Germany. One million people coming from the Ukraine. The German government has already adopted three relief packages. The aim is to reduce prices pressure in everyday life. For this, we have mobilized more than 100 billion euros. We especially want to support people with low and medium income. They suffer the most from current price trends. Here I had got in mind families and students and retired people. In addition, we will soon intervene in the energy market. Our goal is to keep electricity and gas payable, both for private households and for industrial companies. We're talking about around 200 billion euros in this field. But last but not least, we will project jobs in Germany effectively. For this, we will again use our very successful Kurzarbeit or short-term work scheme system. As I said in the beginning, dear friends, Crisis management is necessary, but most also work on social and ecological progress, especially in these times. As the Minister of Labor, I apologize myself to have a view on the labor market. The German labor market is confronted with long-term structural change, and they're rapidly speeded up by this crisis. There, I'm talking about the digital transformation, the decarbonization, and the impact of the demographic change. This change is neither good nor bad, but it would be naive to think that it leads to social progress as by magic. 
Let us look at digital transformation. It's fundamentally changing the labor market. It's true that it's creating new jobs and business models, no question. Just think about platform economy. But it's also true that some sectors will experience job losses, especially in the commerce and banks and insurance systems. And in areas where jobs are not at risk, requirement will change fundamentally. The good news is, and that's very important for progressives and the question how to keep our society together, as far as we know, we will not run out of work. But the uncomfortable news is, in many sectors, the work will be completely different. And that's where we have to react. With strong vocational training and with re- and upskilling, it's, I think, key to do this job. In this way, we will make sure that today's workers can do the work of tomorrow. Then there is climate change and the big issue. As you know, Germany has promised to be greenhouse gas neutral by 2045. This is perhaps the largest transformation of our industry, our economy and our society in the last 100 years. I'm not one of the persons who promise a green job miracle in talk shows. I do not think that is sincere. But, but I strongly believe in this. If we are smart and fast, the green transition of our economy has great job potentials. Let me share an estimate by the ILO. Jobs in the green electricity will roughly triple around the world by 2023 to, uh, to triple. It's like that the greening of our economy will also create new jobs here in Germany. Finally, there is a demographic change. I talked about my age. To be honest, I'm 49. In November, I will be 50. <laughs> and as Minister for the Labour Market and responsible for pensions, I know that the average age in our society is, guess, 48. I'm the, the dark side. But I'm not retiring. But until 2030, the number of persons of work, working age will decrease by about 3.5 million. At the same time, the population of older persons will increase by more than 3 million. On the one hand, this will cause, make the shortage of skilled workers worse. We can already see this in development in many areas today in long-term care and skills, crafts and in restaurants. On the other hand, this holds great potentials for more jobs, just thinking about social and health care services. We want to make better use of this potential for the labor market. For example, mothers or fathers who work part-time part or through they want to work more or persons in long-term unemployment. And let me add, we also need qualified migration to Germany. And that's why my friend, the Minister for, in, for Security and Internal Affairs, Nancy Faeser, and I will present a modern law for um, migration to Germany in this autumn. Dear friends, at the end, I'm convinced that especially in times of crisis, we need progressive policies, policies that link two things, realism and confidence. In hard times, we need effective crisis management and social security. And we also need politicians who shape this transformation actively for a better future. Michael mentioned Allensbach Institute. And I think the biggest challenge is to say it with a great old politician, a great progressive, one of the fathers of our movement in a deep crisis in the early 30s, in the last century. I'm talking about Roosevelt. He said in this famous sentence, we have nothing to fear but the fear itself. And so our mission has to be to give security and hope and confidence. This is a question of our attitude. Secondly, we need to keep our societies together, not just in the question of crisis, but in the question of transition. Or as Olaf Scholz said, you never walk alone. 
and they are two big politicians I quoted. As a small politician, I would be adding for social democrats and for progressives, it's the welfare state, which is key, stupid. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and to give you a moment to breathe, uh, I would like Anka Hassel to, uh, I don't just uh, tell us your thoughts about what was said. <coughs> my my first and main thought is that I feel really old on this panel, <laughs> because <laughs> no, Anke, <I'm laughs> you don't. I'm way over fifty, so you know what can I say? If you feel old at the age of forty-nine, so um, that is my my first impression. My my second impression is... This is fishing for compliments. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my second thought is, you know, if we, if we look at the situation now, and you have described it very well with regard to Ukraine and the challenges there, but we also face a lot of economic challenges in the very near future. And I just think of the IMF, um, which um, published its forecast for next year, two days ago. And that the forecast is for Europe as a whole, 0.5% uh, of uh, GDP growth. Germany will most likely move into a recession. Italy will most likely move into a recession. And all other European countries will also <coughs> not do very well. So we do have a major economic problem, which, will which we have to face in the very near future. And that is in a situation where we just come out of the pandemic. In the pandemic, we spend a lot of money for short-term work, for protecting family incomes, for protecting industries, etc. So it, it will be a very difficult time. And um, the, the package that the German government has um, passed last week with the 200 billion euros to protect um, incomes and in the, the gas price um, cap will be another sort of burden on the economy because it has to be paid for. So, so that is sort of, there's a gloomy sort of immediate picture ahead. And I think we have to, to realize that and to think sort of have, have a short-term strategy how to deal with that. Um, on, on climate change, we can also look at it the other way. And the other way to, to look at it is that in the past 20 years, we all knew what was coming following from the Paris Agreement, following from the commitments that the EU governments have made the, um, and, and many other co countries have made, but we wasted a lot of time. So we did not deliver on these promises for a very long time. And one reason why we did not deliver on that was because energy was cheap. It was very cheap. The, the um, receiving uh, energy from, from Russia was a very cheap way to pursue a growth strategy that all the governments in the EU still had, which was a fossil fuel-based growth strategy. And you know, as long as this was still working and it delivered the growth we wanted and needed, it, there was very little incentive for governments actually to act on their promises, and that was a big problem. Now we are in a very different situation that energy is not cheap anymore, energy is not even available anymore, now we are, for the first time, in a situation that we have to act and that we have to find strategies that make us more independent f from f fossil fuel energies. And that is the opportunity, yeah? Because we, we cannot, we know now, you know, that the pipelines are not even working anymore from Russia. So we know now um, that we cannot p uh, progress in that way. So we have to find new forms of energy supply, we have to move towards renewables, we have to uh, move towards energy saving, et cetera, et cetera. And that gives a big incentive to companies actually to uh, try out business models, which so far have not been viable because the other energy was so cheap. So, so there is a, an opportunity. So there's a short term immediate threat, which is very serious, but there's also a medium term opportunity to say, now we can be much more serious about um, about climate change. And that is the sort of win-win scenario. And that is also the hope that there will be green jobs because it will require, a, you know, we have to find these green jobs in order to make it viable. So what do we need to do or what do we need to, to think about? Um, I think the, the EU has sort of led the way to some extent, and that already started with the next generation EU, where already environment and climate change were a big part of the package. But after that, um, we ha now have fit, fit for 55, which is a very comprehensive package, 
but we, had, we also have Repower EU. So there, there are a lot of sort of proposals on the table coming from the EU, and I think we should look at it as, a, as the opportunity which also guides member states and, and give some um, pressure, put some pressure on member states to actually act on, on these measures which have to be done. And I think the, the missing link in implementing this and delivering this is actually the, the capacity to plan ahead and to uh, anticipate in which areas we actually need to have investments, what is the role of the government, because it, it changes the relationship between the role of business, which looks for viable business opportunities and makes investments where it is worth it, and the role of the government who has to sort of um, put the right framework in, in place that it actually makes sense for business to, to invest in the right place. So I think that is the area where I think the, the, the big challenge now is, you know, how do we get planning capacities how do we get um, a wider you know, energy network in Europe in place? How do we get the mobility networks in place? How do we get the transport networks in place at a European scale, which can both deliver the jobs and deliver the prosperity which we need? So that would be my, my contribution. Thank you. Every time Ankasa said the word opportunity, you were nodding, but I sort of doubt that it, really feels like an opportunity right now as a politician who is concerned with getting money into people's pockets. Okay, crisis is not, uh, I the old sense is crisis is the Greek word for opportunity and for a burden, isn't it? Um, but in fact, it feels a little bit like a burden by now. And it is a burden for our people, for our economy, also for taxpayers' money. But the question is, which alternative do we have? And I totally agree with Anke that we have to speed up in, in, the cha in changing because cheap gas from Russia was, was something like a sweet poison for our industry. They, it was, was a basic of our, our export model of 22% industrial um, based GDP. And the question is, are we able to be an industrialized country in 10 or 15 years far from here? Because we know it will never be as cheap as it was in the next years. But the good news and the opportunity to give an example is the modern infrastructures we have to build very rapidly by now. I'm talking about the LNG terminals at the Lower Saxony coast. I'm a Lower Saxony. Uh, I, I we won an election in Lower Saxony for the foreigners, yes. Uh, but we, we are very fast. We build it in, 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 uh, in this crisis, I think in eight months, these terminals. And on the 21st of December, there will be an LNG terminal in Wilhelmshaven at the German North Sea coast. It's not just useful to use it for LNG gas for the current time, which we do, but it will help to get how do you call it, Wasserstoff, hydrogen for my country to produce in the future steel clima neutral. And I think this example is the way we need these infrastructure investments. But for the current crisis, we have to stabilize our industrial base because if we will lose it in the next two years, there's nothing to transform. It's gone the steel factories, the chemical factories. So the answer is yes, it's a burden, it's a challenge, it's an opportunity. We have to be realistic, this will be hard work. And I think we need the right method for politicians. And your colleague, Mariana Matsukato, has this wonderful idea of mission-orientated policy. And I think this is right, that we use this idea and for that we have to have a strong rule of of, uh, of of the state in the next years of the European Union we have to identify these projects to reach our climate change aims 2045 and 2030 and to speed up but it's hard it, it's tough to be short no question but if it would be easy other ones can do it progressive have to do it I think nobody else Anke, you've written a lot about uh, growth and uh, welfare, and I was asking myself, do you believe that we can 
react to the climate crisis in a way that is uh, doesn't cause more injustice um, and keep growing or do we have to produce less, consume less and redistribute what we have already? Um, I think that, that um, we have to do both. So I think one doesn't include, uh, exclude the other. And um, in, in, some, in some areas we have to consume less. We, you know, there, there are clear areas which are wasteful and um, which would not be viable if the real prices were actually on the price tag. So where, where companies cannot externalize a lot of costs like fast fashion for instance, which is if it wasn't based on exploitation of cheap labor but also of um, very low environmental standards in other countries, uh, you know, s certain industries would not exist. So, and I think in, in these areas, we need to have less consumption, different, more quality consumption than sort, sort of cheap consumption. But at the same time, um, there are ways that we can pursue growth and, um, and, and in line with climate change. And um, so if you now mentioned the book I, <laughs> I wrote, I, I can say a little bit about that. And it is really about how governments use the welfare state in order to pursue growth strategies and, and just explaining how different countries do it in different ways. And it, it all depends on sort of what the key industry in the country is, you know, and if you look at the UK, which is a very financialized country where uh, the financial markets play a big role, they use the welfare state by privatizing pensions, by privatizing ec education in order to feed the financial services industries. So that was the idea of the book. And if you look at Germany, which has a heavy man uh, manufacturing base, the German government tries everything to protect the, the manufacturing base and it is, has good reasons to do so because they are, you know, the, the good jobs are there. And so short-term working, job retention schemes, etc., cetera, is not by chance that they were sort of invented in Germany because they fit perfectly to the German manufacturing base. But we also have uh, other countries and other countries um, it, the, are the Nordic countries. And the Nordic countries are always the sort of the, the best practice countries when it comes, comes to the welfare state. But they're also best pra practice countries when it comes, for instance, for, uh, on, uh, to climate change. They're also um, the best countries when it comes to sort of how far have they are developed in the established in the development of a knowledge economy and where do they create good jobs yeah and they create uh, good jobs much more in services in dynamic services much less in in the manufacturing sector but they can combine these jobs good pa well paid jobs in the service economy with a uh, um, much uh, better environmental record. And I think if we look at the, the diversity within Europe and if we sort of draw lessons from that and see how, what can we learn from each other, we can see that there are countries which are actually doing quite well and I think we should do that in, in order to progress. And how can this transformation work without overwhelming people? This is a one billion dollar question. <laughs> but let, uh, let me think about it and, and says the words to Anke. The funny thing is that I think you know better than me that 20 years ago, um, Gösta Esping Andersen wrote a book about three worlds of welfare for capitalism and he uh, um, talked about the British model, the German or continental welfare state and the Scandics. At the end, the Scandics had been the better one. And if I get you right, we have to look to the north. That's the labor markets are very developed because there is industry, but there is more um, good jobs in the service industry, and I agree this is important for us. Just some ideas what to, first of all, we have to be very careful, not just in this crisis, to keep our so society together, because we need political support for this way. Uh, also, for the aim to fight climate change, it's not a self-going thing to look in the regions to talk about change. I think some years ago, uh, another author, a friend of the Progressive Center here in Germany and progressive author, Robert Miesig, wrote, published a book about the wrong friends of the small people, uh, the right-wing extremists and populists. And we have to be very, very, um, have an eye on that. And that's why we have to build bridges uh, for this transformation, to give some securities. One idea would be to say, okay, we try to 
manage this transformation by giving people a chance that we avoid unemployment in this change before it will happen. The idea of reskilling and upskilling. I'm working uh, on, uh, on a law package on this question because it's very necessary for a good labor force. I talked also about the demographic change we have. And on the other hand, we need these bridges that people have the chance not to be left behind. I think one of the biggest threats for a divided society in this rapid transformation would be a, a splitted labor market. On the one hand, people which have been left behind and have no chance to, to get part of this transformation. On the other hand, companies which can't make a business case because they had no skilled labor force. And this is, is, is one of the challenges I want to give an example. The other one is um, leadership. We have to find the right word to talk about the future. And if it's a dark f future, um, and I, I, excuse me, I, uh, some weeks ago I read an article in the Zeit, <laughs> not by you, uh, but by a colleague. <laughs> and he talked about, okay, um, there will be no growth anymore. This is not a promise for the people, this is a threat. I totally agree with, with Anke that we need have to have a debate on, on the quality of growth. It's not a new debate, but it's very key in these times. But degrowthing societies in this change are a threat for the society and for, uh, for the democracy. I'm deeply convinced. And I, I thought about uh, um, people reading the Zeit, I'm one of people are well, well off with a high income and talking about degrowth and say yes and there will be we have to be honest there's no growth anymore and then I talk a lot to <laughs> say hello <laughs> I just built a bridge to, uh, until Franz is here <laughs> Very warm welcome in Berlin, our friend, the Vice President of the Commission. It's good to have you here, Franz. Thank Schön, dass du da bist. We were just speaking about uh, how to build a climate-friendlier society without overwhelming people. Um, and I was wondering, you are doing all of these climate laws on a European level and Hubertus Heil is uh, in Germany and he's trying to get people into jobs and trying to get money to people who have worked all their life and now have a, just a small pension and how interested are you in what he is doing? <laughs> <laughs> well without what he's doing we will never get to a climate neutral society. The one thing that will decide failure or success is whether we get it right on social justice. This is the very, very most important issue we need to get right. There's nothing more important than that. Because this is a time of profound transition. It's not just a climate crisis, we're in an industrial revolution, we're in a demographic revolution, we're in a geopolitical a very, very unstable environment, not just because of the war Putin has unleashed, but because of what's happening globally. And in that context, people are looking for certainty. People are looking for a prospect they can believe in. And you need to give that to them. You need to be able to prove that this long-term change is not going to leave them behind. And if you look back in our history, every industrial revolution has the propensity to create a small group of huge winners and a huge group of big losers. And we have, to, we have the technology, we have the means, we have the brains to prevent this from happening this time. But it could still happen, it could still happen. That's why his job is the most important job in the climate tradition uh, era. And what? my day. <laughs> <laughs> But what are the, th the threats to what you just said? Because 
Yes, there's you know, revolutions. It's easy for me to say the outcome of all of this is better jobs, cleaner jobs, stabler jobs. And it's true. But that's not the problem. The problem is to get people from the, where they are now to where they can be in the future. And people don't have, many people, especially when, let's call them blue collar people, don't have the feeling today that if they jump, they will land on something positive. They have too, much, too often the feeling if they jump, they'll fall in a black hole. And that's, that's what we need to address. And I, I, think, I think that's also the core of what progressive politics should be about today. It's about redistribution in a fair way. This word has disappeared from our lexicon, redistribution. But politics is always about redistribution. When the right gives tax relief to big companies, that's redistribution. So if you look for the people who are in problems today, whether it's because of energy prices or whether it's because of the precarity of their jobs, looking after them is redistribution to the benefit of the whole society. And I hope the left understands this and starts making plans to make this very concrete. And he's doing that. Well, well, well just one idea or, or one example. F uh, I'm interested in, in, in your uh, view. It's not just how to organize a welfare state for this transition. And your example is very important for us. And I'm calling, uh, I'm talking about the, the so-called blue color colleagues in, in my constituency. And I come from, you mentioned this Famous, famous city of Peine. It's a, it's a small city in Lower Saxony. It's 50,000 inhabitants. When I was a young boy, uh, 10,000 people worked in the steel factory. So we had a structural change in the past. Now 800 are there. So we n have ins experiences. But we have very proud, blue-colored, um, vocational trained um, unionists, IG Metall, colleagues and if I would tell them okay uh, it's over <laughs> goodbye um, it would be the first mistake the second would be to have something like uh, talking about the heads uh, as a minister I, ha I have to be careful if I say sentence like um, you have to have long li li lifelong learning they are hearing uh, prison lifelong prison yeah um, so you have to have the right language and you have to have instruments to build bridges to motivate people to start new i have the automotive company in wolfsburg not far from my constituency they are in a tremendous change but i think they have a good chance to manage this with all the money they have and and uh, all the regulation you make in <laughs> in brussels um but it's the right way i'm not afraid about the colleagues by f in, in, in the Volkswagen company, but we have to care on the pl suppliers because they are orientated on the on the on the uh, old-fashioned, very modern um, uh, motors, and they have to new uh, learn new things. I have an example in my mind: a company which was for me the example of the future of work because they are very skilled. They are engineers. And now they need software engineers there. <laughs> and it's not easy to get software engineers to Pioneer. So we have to educate the workforce which is there. And that's why we need this instrument. And that's why your job is more important for the future of humanity <laughs> to save the planet. But the job you made together with our friend Nicholas Schmidt, uh, the Commissioner for Labor and Social Security, is so important for Europe. We need this just transition. And this is a different, there, there are a, a, a conservatives interested in fighting climate change, no questions, the good news. But they are not interested in social security. And I totally agree, if there's no base in, in, in our population for this way, because peopling, people are fearing that there will be end of their daily life and there will be poverty for them on the elder ki kids and, and families. We have no political uh, support for this very important way for our societies. So it's about instruments, it's about active policy, it's about industry policy, modern uh, one, and it's about the welfare state once again. Uh, not in the old fashioned way, more I think in uh, investing welfare state, not just social securities 
for them who are left behind and to give them social benefit, but to empower them to be part of the solution as a progress, not just for the few, but for a lot of people. Can I give you very quickly an example? I, I went to the Skoda factory in, in uh, Czechia a couple of weeks ago. Also Volkswagen. Volkswagen Group. Okay. There they still make combustion engine cars and they make battery electric vehicles. And I asked them, so now you're moving to this Škoda Enyaq, which is a very successful uh, electric vehicle, and how many, how many workplaces do you lose? How many jobs do you lose in that? He said, none. I said, why? He said, because putting a battery together is manual work. You can't, machines can't do that. So what I'm doing is the people who used to uh, put together uh, combustion engines are now being retrained within the factory to be able to uh, operate the robots and the computers that put the batteries together. And I need everyone, and I invest in them. I think if we could, that logic should be applied to more industries that are going through transformation. You know, the steel industry very well. They will be employing hydrogen rather than uh, 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 lignite or, or gas in the future. But that leads to a transformation of how they work. We need to reskill the working force to be able to do that. And that across industry. And you should give people the security. You're not going to lose your job. You're not going to lose your salary. You will stay and you will be skilled to do something else. I think that's in industry would be a good way forward. And I I have to apologize, Franz, because I have to step back in price management tonight. Oh, okay. uh, but, but I want to say thank you to you, Anna, and uh, to Anke and Franz very personally. Not just that you came to, to Berlin for the Social Democratic Family in the next days and for the Progressive Governance Conference, but for once again one project in my home base in Lower Saxony I mentioned. It's the steel thing. There is a Salzgitter company, and you make it possible that we can support with a lot of public money the change to hydrological steel production in the future. And thank you for that, because I know in a commission where there are some neoliberals left, it's not always easy, easy to find a way for, how do you call it, uh, projects of common interests. Yes. Uh, and you did it. Thank you from uh, the people of my home, because now they are part of transformation and not victims of transformation. This is a job of Franz Timmerman, my friend. Thank you and very much. <laughs> just, just so you know, Salzgitter, Salzgitter was very smart because they were very early in buying into the emissions trading system, so they have a lot of credits they can also use to decarbonize their steel production. I'm sure they will be very successful with green steel. Thank you so much for being here. I would like to speak about one more thing, and that is the uh, well, the decreasing trust in democracies, and um, well, that is also fueled by the feeling that um, there's this green climate blah thing, and now it's overwhelming me, and as a citizen, as a person, and I, I can't do anything against it, um, and. How do you how do governments react to that? Is there even a chance uh, in Pine in uh, Lower Saxony? Uh, we had an election a week ago, and 12% voted for the alternative for Germany, the AfD. Um, what do you do? <laughs> well, f first of all, I think what, what when things become as complex and complicated as they are now, it is a new human nature to look for simple solutions. And it's in the nature of radical politics to offer simple solutions. That's the attractiveness of AfD and other extreme right parties, because they come with a simple solution, and they also have a simple solution for why things are bad. It's always somebody else. It's the Jews, or it's uh, the migrants, or it's, it's uh, uh, us, the left. So that is what we are up against. But the answer is not to come with simple solutions yourself, because you have to be honest to people, and people appreciate that. In a complex situation, the solutions will also be quite complex. But now the answer, how do you combat this? You have to combine your long-term goals 
with short-term visible and tangible successes. So if you want to decarbonize the economy, if you want to help people use less energy, if you want uh, them to install solar panels, heat pumps, and all of that, you have to make that easier for them. And that's possible. It's possible to do that through interventions, through support. You can put small and medium-sized enterprises in a position that they don't have to look for money for this and give some guarantees in the bank so that they can take out their money to invest. That's what we need to be doing. And then people will see, you know, if the neighbor comes to you and says, well, I installed the solar panels, I have a heat pump, look at my energy bill, it's, it's this low now. And you say, wow, that's only one third of what I'm paying. I need to do this. You know, because the, the time in which, you, uh, in which the investment is paid back is, is now five years. And that's very, very short. So I'm just giving you one, one example. Uh, the other example, uh, th there's many examples we, we could give. Uh, uh, go faster in uh, product regulation so that people get buy stuff that doesn't break as easily. And if it breaks, it can be repaired. Uh, and if it can't be repaired, it will be recycled so that they can get some money back. That is something people can relate to. They understand this, and it's a benefit for them. So I think you need to uh, think in terms of long-term change combined with short-term results that could create enthusiasm with people that they understand the changes in their benefit. Do you believe that people like complexity? No, 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 I don't think that people like <coughs> complexity. So my, my family is all lower middle class. And when I want to sort of figure out what, what they, what politics is really about, I talk to them and I, I really realize for, for them it is not ab about complexity. They worry about fuel prices, they worry about energy prices, they worry about rents, they worry about, you know, their, their children, the quality of the school, etc. So this is, n they don't worry about, you know, complex questions uh, about climate change, it is my experience from, from my family. So, but um, just to come back on the question of the, of the far right and how to deal with them, I think we, we should also realize that we are in, an, in a very worrying situation at the moment, um, ever since the war started. And um, then to have a, an election result where the government was basically supported, you know, the, the main governing parties won the election, where the, the far right gained 12%, uh, which is worrying, but it, it also means that, you know, 90%, almost 90% of the voters did not vote for the far right, but had trust in established parties. And uh, and I, I think that is a good result. So, you know, on the one hand, you, you can say, you know, we had hope that the RFD is sort of history or had sort of reached a level of certainly below 10% and it's not a sort of major actor anymore and this didn't sort of materialize. But I think that in this situation, people sort of lash out against the government and, and vote for, for parties uh, that are on the far right is um, it, you know, understandable. Not that I want to excuse it, but I, I, I don't think that is really the, the, the threatening uh, message. The threatening message is always if you do get more support from the far right because we are in insecure times, is when then conservative parties sort of started uh, start to cooperate, you know, because they see them as a as a partner in in winning majorities. I think that is the threatening part, and that is what what the con conversation needs to be about. And we need to sort of call out other political parties who are democratic parties, but nevertheless feel tempted to go into cooperation with the far right, that, you know, that is a no-go. I think that is the, the real discussion we need to have. But it seems logical to do that. If I was a conservative party, I'd, I'd do just that to weaken the progressive parties. Well, um, well the, the, the advantage of being on the left is that you have a lot of experience also with being in the opposition. Um, <laughs> and so, nice so, quote. So, so you are used to that and you can deal with that. That's a problem of the center-right. They cannot deal with being in the opposition. So they crave being in power so much that they will pact literally with the devil to come back to power. Now, we've seen this in my country where the Christian Democrats was a leading force. They went into a government where they had the support of the extreme right. That is 12 years ago. They're still suffering from it. They never recovered from it because it broke the, the spine of the movement. Uh, because it divided them profoundly between those who have principles and those who want power. 
and they never recovered. And I can tell you, the EPP at the European level will suffer tremendously uh, for supporting the extreme right in Sweden, for, for supporting the extreme right in Italy. Look at, look at them. In elections, they all lose. And then they think they won because they're in a, a coalition that is, is going to be in power. But they themselves have lost. At the end of the day, people prefer the original. So if they bring the extreme right to power, I mean, this country should know this experience. You, you don't bring them to power thinking that you can, uh, that you can appease them or, 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 or show that they are liars, etc. Because they have understood one thing very well, and that is a very old lesson. I don't want to refer to all the history, but let's look at Putin. What is Putin's secret? One of his secrets is that he understood that he needed to fully control the media so that he could control the narrative and could control where people's hearts and minds would be. That is what Orban did. He learned it from Putin, and he did it successfully. That is what uh, the right tries to do everywhere. And they have very, very powerful allies. Mr. Murdoch is one of their allies. Look at what Fox is doing in the United States. And we should not be, on the left, we should not be so naive about this. And we should be much more up in arms, and we should be much more vocal against the center right. You're not just helping them, you're killing yourselves. Don't do it. Where will you be 10 years from now if you help them into power? And then, you know, uh, I, I, think, I, think, I think one of our missions is to talk about that. But at the end of the day, people will not vote for us because we, 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 we show uh, the mistakes of the others. You know, if I, if I run a bar here in Berlin, I'm not going to advertise by saying the bar next door is shit, you should come to me. You know, I, I can only get people into my bar if my bar is good. And so we should concentrate on the policies we have to offer uh, to our citizens. And I believe we have very good policies to offer. If you don't mind, I would like to open up this space for questions in the audience. There's one, there's two. Maybe we collect a few and then, yeah, so... You'd like to start? Do we have a microphone for people? Yes. Great. Yes. Oh, you have to hold it. Okay. Thanks. Hands free. Um, my name is Jackie O'Reilly. I'm from the University of Sussex in the UK and director of the Digital Futures at Work Institute. Um, it's lovely to be here. I've really enjoyed it. But there are a couple of points missing. Um, from this discussion that I think are really important. Um, first of all, I'm really glad you have encouraged the audience to ask questions. The problem I have a bit is, where is the word creativity? Why aren't you saying to people, let's use your creativity to deal with this crisis? So let's take a minuscule example. When we didn't have PPE equipment, what did people do? They got on their sewing machines at home on their WhatsApp and said they were making masks for the local hospitals. This created a great sense of solidarity, of community, of actually contributing to things. The word creativity of what people can do, their sense of agency, seems to be missing in this debate. This debate is about what you are going to do to the workers. The workers will be processed from being workers in a steel factory to workers in an eco-steel factory without a sense of what do the workers themselves want to do? Where is their agency? Where is their ability to be creative human beings themselves? So how will the policies you offer in your fab bar, I'm sure it would be really cool, um, how will they make people want to come in it and say, that is the place to go, because that is where I am valued. That is where I get a space to be somebody, to be more than just a factory worker, to be able to explore educational opportunities in whatever form they come. And that, to me, I find kind of obviously challenging because it just there's that aspect of people have things done to them rather than their ability of agency. And secondly, this other debate you had earlier about the kind of product, uh, growth. Uh, there's only so many jobs to go around. There's only so much economic growth. And somehow, it we're going to run out. So somebody's not going to get a bit of the, a bit of the discussion there is a bit of this debate of the end of work type of debate. It did sound like that. And without discussing creativity, we don't understand the whole industrial relations of how we did create different things we didn't even know we'd have. 
And I just feel that that needs to be much more part of the discussion I've heard tonight. I, I fully understand what you're saying, but let, let me respond to, to one specific issue you mentioned, creativity. People who worry on an existential level about being able to pay the rent, being able to pay the energy bill, being able to send their kids to school, being able to buy the necessity they need. Creativity is not the first thing that comes to mind. What comes to mind is, do I still have a job? Are they going to take my job away or are they going to help me find a better job or reskill to do it? And I think it is our task to answer that challenge uh, because once people have some basic security in their lives, they know that social security will have their backs if they get into trouble, then of course they can be more creative. But if the only worry they have is, how am I going to make it until the end of the month? They're not going to be creative and they're certainly not going to be worried about the end of the planet. Uh, so, so we all have an interest in assuring that people have a basic sense that they will not be abandoned, that there is someone who has their backs. And in this day and age, you know, this is a role for the state, whether we like it or not. The state will have to organize that for people, together with social partners, obviously, but the, 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 the depth of the transformation our societies are going through demand public action. And the creativity can also be unleashed if you empower local authorities to take that action. If you allow people to, sh to for instance, look for their own energy resourcing in, in the community level. Uh, which is something I think has a huge future. Um, so I, I would look for creativity there, but I just wanted to, to as a counter-argument to what you're saying, I'm all about creativity, but I can afford to be about creativity because I know I will not starve at the end of the month. But if you, if you worry that your job will disappear and that you will be penniless, you know, the first thing you want is for somebody to tell you, we have your back. And, and I think that's, we, we should not forget the primary role of a social market economy to make sure people don't, you know, don't fall uh, between the cracks. Thank you. I suppose there was two questions there, and uh, how about the time? Like, do we? Is, is it fine? Okay. There was two questions here. Um, thank you so much. My name is Christina Stankamuste. I work for a data company, one of those platform companies. I wanted to ask you because I've been. Um, discussing and uh, noticing very much the difference between, you know, your very compelling political message about the end of the planet and the way that we are, you know, we have to do something, and the way it arrives to businesses and big concerns, because they are not thinking in terms of we should save the planet or we should save the workers or we should save the market economy. They are looking in terms of costs and their supply chains breaking down and adding more bureaucracy. So coming back to your idea about how we should reshape the narrative, including around SDGs, including around um, you know, uh, ESGs. I was wondering if it's not very important so we focus that this uh, whole sustainability part doesn't become another argument against the West, against um, industry, against you know, the goals that we want to achieve together. And I was wondering if you have a sort of initiative about better communicating that, that it is a positive thing, this transformation can be positive and it is positive. Because the industry is not seeing that. Thank you. Well, I think if you say the industry, you, you, th these are really broad brush strokes. There's part of industry that does see it and, and does want to go into the right direction. I, 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 I spoke, for instance, today to uh, an international gathering of people who want to invest in green hydrogen. That's big industry. These are not small players. So, so, so there is part of industry that does understand this. But other parts of industry are actually in the same situation as some of our workers, you know. Am I, is my, is my company still uh, uh, alive next year, uh, given all the energy price and all the other things? So it's these two elements come together now, uh, much in industry. But um, the fact that we were able to, to collectively borrow a lot of money to invest in economic transformation, the fact that the governments in the EU came up with plans that will help this transformation go into, into the more sustainable direction, could help us deliver, in the short run, some really good results. And up on top of that, because you, you, you added to that the, the, the developing world, which I think is a very, very strong point, because we will be criticized a lot by them at COP in Sharm el-Sheikh. What we need to do is to change the international financial system 
to put the, inter, uh, the IFIs, the international financial institutions, and the investment banks in a much stronger position to be able to invest seed money to lower the threshold for private investors to come in. Because uh, when I was at, at the United Nations General Assembly a couple of weeks ago, I had a meeting, uh, uh, the Clinton Global Initiative brought together a lot of investors, and I was saying how much money is represented around the table. And they were talking about dozens of trillions potentially. And all of them were saying, we want to invest, um, but we're not sure about whether this investment can be sustained. Could you help us? I think that's a good question, and I think we should be doing that. And if we help a country, you know, I was, uh, I was talking to the president of Senegal the, uh, the other day. His, the average age in this country is 19. Can you imagine that? 19. Uh, and, and the country's growing so fast, if he doesn't get investment, it's the Wagner Group who will dictate the direction of the country. It's, you know, I was in Africa and everybody's, uh, young people are very often a big fan of Putin because they, he feeds into their sense of nationalism and anti-colonialism. So if we can bring real investments there, uh, as I say, you know, we, we don't want to sell you our green steel, we want you to make your own green steel. If we can make that credible in the next couple of years, then we can change the narrative, I believe. I suppose we have two minutes for one more question that will be briefly answered, and you were raising your hand before, so, and you were also nodding very, very much <laughs> all the time, so the, you yeah. qualified for this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Arfur, I'm a master's student of the Hertie School of uh, Governance, <laughs> and uh, I had a question about how uh, progressives all over Europe uh, can take back power, that's a very important thing, of course, uh, to face these issues, and I think it's very important to um, unite the working class uh, voters with the upper class uh, voters, and in uh, Europe we all see initi initiatives of uh, progressive parties connecting with each other, and even fuse uh, what we see in France, or what we see in your home country in the Netherlands, where GroenLinks and PvdA are trying to merge, and uh, I was curious on your view uh, in this, and if you support uh, the merge of uh, GroenLinks and PvdA. I, I will stop you. Uh, is there another question in the audience? Because then we collect them, and they could be answered all together. No? Okay. No. Okay. No. Hello, Just I'm one. Uh, okay. Sorry, uh, Judith Langowski, a journalist, and uh, I was wondering if you're talking, it also connects a little bit to your comment about Senegal and um, investing in other countries, because at least also what you see in, in Europe, um, a lot of the energy um, and sustainability movement transition is also relying on maybe connecting with forces that you don't necessarily as progressives want to connect with. We see that with Robert Habeck's visit to Qatar a couple um, months ago, and also with how Hungary is um, uh, establishing itself as a player in the whole uh, electric vehicle battery field. So how, can, how much do you think are these alliances necessary for the transition, for the just transition, and how much can they be avoided? Well, I'll start with the second question. Um, I believe that if we can't overcome, I, I think, frankly speaking, the, this winter will be difficult, next winter will be probably even a bit more difficult, then we have another winter that might be challenging, but after that, the transition to renewables, <laughs> no, I mean, I mean lo look at it in a bit longer perspective. It, it's going to be three tough years. Let's be honest. I have to be honest with you. I always want to be honest about these things. It's going to be three tough years, I think. But after those three years, the, 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 the pace with which renewables will be introduced will be such that our dependency on fossil fuels will be reduced quite rapidly. But we will not be able to liberate ourselves completely of fossil fuels between now and, let's say, a, a, a small decade. Huh? So in that context, we will have to have uh, 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 contracts with countries, preferably in our neighborhood, but also globally, that could help us overcome this transitionary period. And yes, that means that you also deal uh, with countries uh, that, uh, where you disagree fundamentally with their politics. The only thing you have to avoid is that we ever, ever recreate a situation that they can blackmail us with those contracts. And that's why we're trying to diversify. Um, the second thing which, which drives me really crazy is that we still have not 
decided on the European level to do collective buy-in of the energy we need. We're still, member states are still competing against each other. One of the reasons why the prices for energy are higher in Europe than in Asia is because we're competing against each other in filling our reserves. That should stop. We should do collective buy-in, and then we should also have a system of solidarity at the European level that no, not one member state will be literally left in the cold when Russia cuts them off so that we can provide them with the energy we have collectively bought uh, when they need it uh, at a price they can afford. So that is what we need to do in the short run. And, and yes, is that, does that mean that you have to deal with uh, uh, countries that uh, do not share our values, to put it extremely mildly? Yes, sadly it does uh, for uh, the time being. But I also believe that our energy sovereignty will rapidly increase because, you know, the exciting thing is renewables are becoming so cheap. The technology is going so fast. Uh, you know, if you look at a heat pump five years ago, you would have to insulate uh, your homes at an incredible level for that heat pump with a lot of electricity to be able to provide a bit of warmth. Now, with relatively little electricity, with relatively uh, normal insulation, you can easily heat a home with a modern uh, heat pump. That went so fast. And I'm so excited about that, and this is the way forward. And that's also a very concrete way of showing to people who can't afford it themselves that we can bring their energy bills down, that we can improve the quality of their homes and all of that. And I think this should be a, a program uh, for... Uh, why do I believe... Then, finally, your question. Why do I believe that... And in Germany, it's a difficult debate because the Greens have been so long established and they also grew in opposition to uh, the Social Democrats and the Social Democrats always like to oppose a bit to the Greens. But why do I believe in the destiny of these two movements to come together. The green movement has a propensity to look at the green issues and only in second position at the social issues. The social democratic movement is exactly the other way around. And together they come, uh, uh, they create the right balance because what the, what you will see in the years to come, and it's already starting, you see it in the UK and other places, is that the right will oppose social justice to climate justice and say climate justice will come at the expense of social justice. Now, if they succeed in that, we will neither have social justice nor climate justice because there can be no climate justice without social justice and no social justice without climate justice. That's why I believe in this cooperation. Thank you, too, so much for this discussion. Um, I ask everyone to stay just for five more minutes because Diego and Florian are going to say some final words uh, to this conference and uh, we're gonna leave the stage then, I guess. Huh? Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, dear guests and speakers and uh, friends and partners, um, the sad news is that the Progressive Governance Summit is slowly drawing to a close, at least what the part here on stage is concerned. But the good news is um, the Progressive Governance Summit will continue outside because we have some more cheering and coming together and possibly even um, some dancing left to do. Um, <laughs> it makes us really happy um, and I think I can speak of all the hosts that um, um, we've, after two years of digital meetings, have now come together again as a progressive community and um, yeah, actually not just seeing each other but you know, have been in a room with each other and um, I think from all the conversations we've had um, uh, with most of you, um, it fills us with joy that you feel the same and that you really enjoyed uh, coming together again um, here in Berlin. We have to say um, it hasn't been uh, 
an easy part uh, bringing this uh, summit together. And um, this goes back, obviously, to months, uh, I don't want to say years, but months of planning, because um, what we've heard in the discussions today and um, what's been going on, especially in the last eight months, um, has been no less than a historical turning point. And what we've learned from all of you, from the uh, more than a dozen European countries, um, from our colleagues from the US and from Canada, is that um, our progressives' reform agendas um, are at risk um, due to the um, aggression uh, of Putin and the outbreak of war in the Ukraine and the economic and social impact that's associated with this. So we haven't um, had as much progress as we would have liked. But we've come together last night and today uh, to join forces, which was the theme of the conference, to discuss strategies, best practices, develop campaigns that will hopefully uh, all inspire us and help us uh, to go back and uh, bring us back on the path um, of progression and a path of uh, progressive politics. So thank you all for doing that and taking all of these good ideas um, back home. Because what we've learned is that as we are making mistakes, we are also making progress. And Dominic said it th this morning, and uh, Hubertus just re-emphasized it um, on the panel, that, um, I mean, we don't uh, mean the cynical, but um, in the moment of crisis, um, um, if we get it right, if we get the mechanics right, um, there's also an opportunity uh, for progress. And um, I think we should all take that home and bring that forward. Thank you, Florian. So you may have heard that this is Europe's largest conference for progressive politics. And if you don't believe that, I think you will believe that after I thank all the co-hosts and partners. <laughs> These partners and co-hosts represent many political traditions from green, liberal, left, and social democratic, and a little bit more depending on what country you come from. So bear with me here. I'm gonna go through our list of 27 co-hosts and partners. They deserve to be thanked. We could not have done it without you all. I still have to read 27 names, so don't get too excited. So, first, our wonderful co-host in, I believe, alphabetical order, the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, the Green European Foundation, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, PES, the Party of European Socialists, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung Foundation, um, the European Greens, the University of Constance with the Cluster of Politics for Inequality, the Heinrich Böll Foundation, and PPI, um, our friends from Washington, D.C., the Progressive Policy Institute. So thank you to all the co-hosts who made this year possible. We also want to give a warm thanks to all of our partners, um, Arena Gruppen from Sweden, Broadband Institute all the way from Canada, the Center for American Progress, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, Demos Helsinki, Global Progress, Global Solutions, the World Policy Forum, the Helen Clark Foundation, all the way from New Zealand, <laughs> Woo! the Kalecki Foundation, Placemaking Europe, Policy Solutions, the Renner Institute from Austria, Terra Nova, and Fundación Alternativas. We also, yeah, a round of applause. <laughs> We'd also like to thank our media partners, the Green European Journal and the New Statesman. And last but not least, um, we would also like to thank the Berlin Senate and Open, so Open Society Foundations who supported this event. Um, once again, big round of applause. If you know of a conference that is supported by a broader range of progressive foundations and institutions, in Europe, then let me know and they can take our title. So thank you very much and back to you, Florian. Last but not least, um, we've got um, five more announcements, but they will be brief. But the first one is uh, the most important one. Um, so dear team at Das Progressive Zentrum, 
it has not been easy, but the greatest and biggest thank you uh, goes out to you for all of your passion, all of your patience, and all of your precision. <laughs> Second, um, so um, dear guests, um, we're going to depart eventually tonight, but um, progressive governance is going to continue. So stay tuned over the next uh, months and years, and there's obviously more to come. And um, the third point is, um, and here I'd like to uh, welcome Maria on stage once again, our summit host. And uh, <laughs> we would say, we'd like to say a very, very warm thank you also to Maria, because it's been absolutely excellent. It went so far that last night the colleagues from The Guardian uh, suggested that Maria should consider career switch going into um, you know, TV broadcasting, <laughs> going into telly. <laughs> so uh, it's been absolutely wonderful. And thank you so much, Maria. No, that was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We, you, it's 12 hours we've been together today. So... I think um, it must have been good, basically. It's been a great event. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> yeah, and uh, last but not least, um, please join us um, for the after party. Um, there will be music, um, there will be drinks, um, maybe even two drinks uh, outside at the bar. Very important, if you're still hungry, there's a food truck downstairs, so you can grab a snack um, you know, to get some more energy for the rest of the evening and yeah please stay around and yeah uh, for the rest of the evening with us thank you so much it's been a real pleasure <laughs>